Good morning, church. Sorry, we're having a little bit of technical problems. Welcome. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Pastor Mike. I just want to greet you on this last Sunday of 2023. How exciting. Um, as you think about the things that have happened this past year, um, as I think back at the things that have happened this past year, my primary thought is God has been faithful. And uh, I'm reminded of Lamentations 3, uh, verses 20. Which is, uh, sorry, verse 22, which says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And indeed, the Lord is faithful. So as we think and as we worship the Lord together, um, let's be reminded of the Lord's faithfulness. So let me pray for us and then we can continue in our worship service. Father God, we thank you for your, your faithfulness. You have been so good to us, so faithful, so kind so worthy of our worship. And so, Lord, as we gather today, would you be honored and glorified this day as we gather today. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to start with a new song. It's called We Crown You. And it just talks about how um, God's love has carried through and shown through Jesus' sacrifice. And from the crown of thorns that he wore to, you know, all the whipping and all the pain that he went through to bring us together. And so I thought this was a very fitting song to talk of his love. So you guys can stand. Thank you. 
since it's the end of the year, um, let's just reflect on all the things that God has done for us. I know that it's been a tough year for some of us, but His mercies are new every morning, and His faithfulness is still true even today. And so, as we're looking forward to the next year, starting tomorrow, um, let's just remember that our God is still faithful, and our God is still good. Mm-hmm.
the Lego company, when they, they kept making these different versions over the years, they thought they were, they were making changes that were better. I'm kind of a traditionalist. I like to go with the old stuff, so I think that maybe the changes weren't always so good. But either way, like when I look at all my old Star Wars Legos versus some of the new stuff that maybe Levi and Beth Bethany are playing with now, um, it reminds me that things are changing. Um, and so, think about for the last year, how many of you guys had a birthday this past year? How many of you guys had a birthday this past year? Uh, and you grew a year older, you changed, right? How many of you guys grew taller this past year? Yeah, I think all of you grew taller as well, you changed. How many of you, uh, I have to think for this one, how many of you had changes in your family this past year? Yeah? Me too. My grandma uh, passed away. She went to be with Jesus this past year. That was, that was a big change for us. So when we think about how things change, sometimes the changes can be really good. Sometimes they can be not so good. But when we think about those, it's really helpful to remember that through it all, uh, God does not change. He's the one constant thing in our life. And that's why it's really helpful to put our trust in him through all of the, the change that happened. In the Bible, uh, one of Jesus' brothers, named James, he wrote a book called James. You know, he decided to do that. And this is what he said about uh, why we can trust in a God that doesn't change. He said that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change, like shifting sadness. So that's really good news for us. If God gives us good gifts and he doesn't change, that means he's always going to be there for us. He's always going to give us good gifts. Whether it's 2023 or 2024, and whether you are 10 or 11 or 6 or 3, and whatever birthday you're going to have this next year, God's going to be there with you. Let me pray for us, and then we can get back to our mom again. God, thank you so much for not changing for being the constant uh, good provider for us throughout the highs and lows of this past year. And thank you that you're gonna be there with us in the changes of this next year as well. And I pray that uh, every uh, boy and girl here knows that and trusts you in that. In Christ's name, amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and have a seat and we're gonna have some announcements.
there's no reason to forget this because it changes to 2024 next week, but we will, or tomorrow, we will start adding new memory verses as well. Uh, you may remain standing as I read the passage for today. Today, we'll be hearing from Jason Chan. He's speaking on Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Jason is, has been a member of T4C for nearly 10 years now. And a fun fact he tells me is he's originally from Singapore. Um, in the passage, as I read for us and you listen along, uh, make a note of the repetition. There's a lot of repetition, and he's going to highlight some of that in his message today. So Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You may have a seat. I know how much time and effort it goes into uh, preparing and designing a class and then grading as well. So Pastor Maya let us uh, four weeks uh, share his knowledge about preaching, tips and sort of uh, tricks around preaching, and also read all our sermons. Right? And that's a lot of work. So I really appreciate that. And I also want to share my gratitude to um, the fellow brothers who have uh, been with me through this uh, sermon practice. They sat through my practice sermons and gave me very good feedback. Right. So thank you for all, all of you. And let me just start with a word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to give thanks to you. Uh, thank you for this Sunday. As we read your word, Lord, um, open up our, our ears so that we may hear your word, open up our minds so that we can understand your word. And most importantly, open up our hearts so that we can understand and take our words to heart. In your sense of the title of my sermon today is uh, God's Love in Action, Genesis uh, 1 to 3. When I was younger, I watched American movies, and some of the movies that I watched uh, in Singapore, they depicted a nighttime routine of parents putting their kids to sleep. And this routine usually has these three steps. The first step is reading a bedtime story to their kid, followed by a kiss on the kid's uh, forehead. And then finally, the parent, be a mom or dad, would say, I love you, sweet. Right? Uh, and as a kid growing up in the 80s in the Asian family in Singapore, unfortunately, I don't get any of that. I did a check with my peers at school. I said, like, oh, did your mom put you to sleep? Or dad put you to sleep with your kids? And say, I love you. And they check the same sort of uh, fortune as me. They don't get a lot of such uh, verbal words of uh, you know, love. Uh, in fact, uh, words of affirmation, right? Could you progress to the next slide? Words of affirmation and saying love verbally, right? That's not a strong suite of Asian parents to kids of my generation. Right. Things might have changed right now, and, uh, but back in those days in Singapore especially, that is not a strong suit. 
right? And unfortunately, you know, words of affirmation tends to be one of my ways of receiving love. Right? Let's move on to the next slide, please. And so when I first encountered Christianity when I was uh, 15, I got to learn that God loved us, but I found it quite difficult to understand what does that truly mean, right? Um, especially I don't have a good reference to actually draw from. And I suspect that many of us, perhaps some of us, you know, as young believers, you are also thinking about that. What does it mean when we say God is love? Uh, for mature believers, you know, do we truly understand the nature of God's love? So broadly there, you can sort of see this taxonomy between uh, different types of people. Atheists, they believe that there is no God. And one of the core reasons that they don't believe there's a God is that based on their experience of life, uh, they think that there is, it's not possible for a omnibenevolent supreme being in this world that could love them unconditionally. To believers, yes, we believe that there is a God, and God loves us, but do we truly understand how He loves us? And what is the type of love that God is capable of? And today we're going to explore this uh, topic a little, right? And the love that God is uh, able to show us is quite apparent, and you could actually draw from the first book in the Bible, Genesis, right? I wanted to speak about uh, this event of God calling Abraham in particular. So why did God call Abraham? What is the significance of that? And using this event, I was springboard into helping us to see God's intention for the world and also to get a glimpse of His love on that. Um, a quick answer to those questions that I pose, significance and what it God call Abraham. Basically, a quick answer to that can be seen in the very last verse over here. Um, the end goal that God wanted us to get is that all families of the earth shall be blessed through this calling. All right. And in order for us to see the full intention of God, we need to go back in history. Prior to Genesis 12, we want to look at what happened before that. If we advance a slide, thank you. So right after God created Adam and Eve, we see a series of things happening. In Genesis 3, um, we saw the first scene coming in. Right? Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, and that led to the fall of men and women. Um, they took on the forbidden fruit, and as a punishment, they were ejected from the Garden of Eden, and they don't have access to the Garden of Eden. Quickly after that, the next scene came up. That is the first murder that we ever know in human history. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, Cain actually killed his brother out of jealousy, right? Uh, and for that, um, the punishment that he received is that all his labor become unfruitful and he has to live the rest of his life uh, with this guilt of killing his brother. Following that, in Genesis 6, we see that uh, the wickedness and the evil of people did not quite stop there. In fact, it actually grew to an extent that it's uh, so grievous that it made God very, very sad. And the punishment for that is that God sent a universal flood that covered the earth for 40 days, like wiping out every single living being except Noah and his family and a bunch of animals. Right? And the chapter before our uh, main chapter today, 12, uh, in 11, after this great flood, the sin did not end there, right? Uh, we saw that uh, men and women became very ambitious. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They went to Babel, colluded together to be a tower so that the goal is to reach the heavens. And God did not like that. And uh, as a result of this, God conf 
seize their languages and scatter them throughout the world. Right? And as you can see, after the creation of men and women, there is this continuous cyclical pattern where sin happens, right? A punishment was invoked to make uh, humans realize that this is bad, but it did not stop that. The next scene comes out, right? So it just keeps repeating over and over again, right? So quite simply, if we were to think about this, right, if we were left to our own devices, man and woman, human race in general, we are heading very directly straight to this, on this path of eternal death. Because we know that the penalty of sin is, is death. Right? And God saw that this is coming, and He decided that He has to intervene, and He came up with a multi-year, multi-generation plan to actually change things. Alec, could you have to move to the next slide? Thanks. And so right after the level we see in 12, God came to Abraham, and He has a set of instructions for him. Right. He said, let's have you leave your hometown, leave your parents, leave your ancestors, who by the way are worshipping idols, right? Go to this new land that I would give to you. You will be made into a great nation, right? I will bless you such that your descendants will be numerous, right? That's in verse 2. And through your people, you will be a blessing to others, right? And then finally in verse 3, it says that through you, all, not just people around you, but all families um, in this world shall be blessed. And we learn that after the Old Testament, right, it is through Abraham's line that Jesus was born. And because of Jesus' death, our sins were paid uh, through his death on the cross. And that's how we broke out from the sin cycle, right? So now that you have seen sort of the overall scheme of things, right, the plan that God has in place, right, you might wonder, so what is this whole thing about, you know, God setting in a plan, a redemption plan for us? How does it relate, right, to God's love? Here I wanted to offer three insights for us. And the first insight I wanted to offer for us is uh, that of God's love is unconditional, right? From Genesis 3 to 11, we've seen how men have offended God in, with all different kinds of sin and disobedience. God himself being a holy and righteous judge, he cannot tolerate sin, right? And as a righteous judge, no sin can go unpunished. But at the same time, God is also an omnibenevolent God, right? And let's move back. And because of this nature of him, right, he's both a judge, but at the same time, he's a benevolent God. He upholds his unconditional love for us, and at the same time, his holy judgment for us in perfect tension. Right. Each of these things, they do not sort of violate one another. And he was able to achieve that through the act of sending Jesus to the world to die for us uh, on the cross. As his punishment uh, for the sins of this world, he chose Jesus to sort of die this death, which is known as one of the most painful deaths that is known to human history, right? The act of crucifixion, um, if you know about it, the process is as follows. You would be having a seven inch long thick nail driven through the hands of Jesus, right? And this very act of driving a thick and long nail in the hand would severe the median nerve in the palm. That will cause immense pain. And at the same time, it will paralyze Jesus' hand, right? So when Jesus was crucified, two hands are on the cross, nailed to the cross, 
The bulk of the body's weight will be hanging by solely these two arms. And as you can imagine, our hands are not meant to carry the weight of the body. And so this pulls down on the hand. And as a result of that, people who are crucified on the cross because of this weight, their arms are extended by six to seven inches. All right? And once the arms were to give way, the entire body's weight would be now supported by Jesus' chest. And so in order for him to hold his body up, he has to continuously breathe like this to hold up his body weight. So he goes into this state of perpetual inhaling. And because of this perpetual inhaling, the final cause of death will be suffocation. And I know that this description that I've given to you is very, very visual, but I think it's very important for us to know this is the exact price that Jesus has paid for people before us, for the sins that we commit in this generation, and also for the sins that are going to be committed by people after us. Right? And what is amazing to me when I read this text over here is that when God hatched this plan of a redemptive um, plan for human beings, right, and for men and women, Jesus is in the know that this is the kind of punishment, a very painful punishment that he has to endure. He knew about that. He accepted it. He said yes to the cross. Right? And, that's just, and what is even more amazing about this is that if you consider the state, right, when Jesus accepted this punishment, it just blows my mind, right? If we were to think about the relationship that we have with God, right, we as sinful creatures, we are evil, right, and by this um, nature, we are basically enemies of God, because God is a holy God, we cannot tolerate sin, and this is listed in Romans 5 times. We are the unlovable in God's standard. We have nothing good to give to God. And uh, God could have directly punished us, and He should, but because He loves us so much, He decided to send His Son instead, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. Well, you know, for a human being to die for another human being, that is the ultimate show of love in this world. And through extraordinary circumstances, yes, we do see that in this book, right? A parent dying for a child, a child dying for a parent, right? Dying for his siblings, spouses, sometimes they die for each other, very good friends, comrades, they die for each other. But to die for an enemy willingly, I would say that's a whole new kind of love out there, right? Um, and Jesus that willingly accepted this death for us so that we can be redeemed and we can break out of this sin cycle. He did this, he said yes to the cross, right? Uh, even before we love him, even before we had a chance to come to this world. And that's why I submit to you that you know, the first aspect of God's love is that this is an unconditional love. In fact, I would even go as far to say that uh, this type of love is not humanly possible. It is uniquely God's kind of love. Right, that's my first insight for you. The next um, insight I wanted to share with you talks about uh, God's love is, is very wide. So when I was young, I had this uh, thinking when I was First, reading the Bible, trying to understand this, I read that, oh, you know, God has chosen a group of people in the Middle East, the Israelites, to be His people. And I started to think, like, oh, why did God choose Israelites to, you know, do His work, right? Why did He not choose Asian people to do that? Why did He not choose Chinese people to do that? Do he, did He like the Israelites better? As I grew older, right, uh, I got a job and I got on in the roles, I got responsibilities and uh, leadership positions. 
Uh, and if you think about it, if you have all these roles and leadership positions, be it at school, at work, uh, at church, it means that you have uh, a task on hand. People are entrusting responsibilities to you. And if those responsibilities are not performed properly, right, your team, your department, your group, even your company and yourself will suffer consequences. Right? So that is not to be taken um, lightly. And so the thing over here, when the Israelites are elected by God right, to do this entire task, Right. This is not something to be taken lightly. They're given a responsibility to look, to look at Genesis verse 3b. Right. It says here very, very clearly, God's instruction is in you. Right. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. In fact, uh, if we move on to the next uh, slide, please. God had wanted um, the Israelites to be His instrument. So as to demonstrate you know, who he is and what his values are to the rest of the book. And if we were to take a moment and sit back and think about this a little, right? A group of people, the Israelites in the Middle East, normal people, like you and I, right? We are sinners, we are imperfect, and this group of people who are imperfect are tasked to represent a perfect Holy God, right? That is a very, very tall order, right? Not easy at all. In fact, uh, I would say this is not favoritism, it's quite the opposite, right? Uh, because when the Israelites are chosen to be his instruments to represent God, they are being put on a high level of standards, right? In fact, from the Bible stories, we know that that is true. Right, Israelites are uh, put through trials and trials. Abraham himself, right, his faith was tested greatly when God asked him to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Right, very, very hard to do. Israelites were tested uh, to fully rely on God when they were wandering around in the wilderness, not just for one week. In one week, it would be like just car camping, you know, not too bad. <laughs> Not one year, but 40 years in the wilderness, fully relying on the sustenance and the providence of, of God. Right? And it, especially when it comes to idol worship, Israelites were punished very, very severely. You, in fact, you've seen a couple of instant death right? for Israelites that do not fall closely to God's instruction. And all of this is needed so that the world can know about God. Through God's interaction with the Israelites' life and God's intervention right, in their life so that it becomes apparent that there is a supreme being out there. This is uh, the Israelites' God. And the final objective of that is that God will light the world you know, through the lives of the Israelites and they share the same faith. Let's proceed to the next slide. Thank you. And Apostle Paul, a prolific scholar of God's Word, explained this last part very well. Right? Uh, the promise that God has given to Abraham to bless his family, to bless um, the rest of the world uh, through him, basically is being reiterated in Paul's letter to Romans in Romans 5, 6. This promise you know, is guaranteed to all his offspring, and all his offspring refers to not just the folks in the direct bloodline, but also, as I highlighted over here in the underlying segments, also to the ones who share the same faith as Abraham. So as long as we share the same faith as Abraham, right, we are considered the same family and we'll be blessed by God, and that is God's uh, providence. Let's proceed to the next one. And so the first two things that I've mentioned over here, you know, God's love is unconditional, God's love is wide, right? Uh, His love transcends all countries, all races, all culture, all people, right? A very wide love. It's very nicely summarized in this verse in Ephesians 3, 18, 
right? The love for the people, we should grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep the love of Christ. Right? Let's just move on to the next one. My final insight for us uh, about God's love is that God acts on His love. Let's advance that one more. So in verse, uh, in chapter 12, this is the first time ever that God has put His unconditional and white love into action. Right? If you were to do sort of an inductive study of what is mentioned in these three verses, we'll see that the word I will, an action word, shows up numerous times. Right? It says, uh, God says to Abraham, go from your country to the land, I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. And he who dishonor you, I will curse. Right? And so from here it's quite evident that this redemptive plan right, is not something that's um, done by humans, but God is the one that initiates and He's the one that brings His promises to the end, right? In fact, uh, as we know, right, all of His promises that God has given, right, to Abraham and to uh, His descendants, all of His promises have been fulfilled, right? Abraham has indeed set food into the promised land of Canaan. Uh, God has allowed Abraham to have an offspring, Isaac, and through all Isaac, a large amount of descendants uh, came out and they formed a great nation. Uh, his promise that he would, you know, make um, Abraham sort of name great, that was fulfilled as well. He became the father of fathers, right? Uh, he is also the father of faith, as we have read later on. And then the last piece, which is uh, verse 3b, in you, the rest of the, all the families in this world will be blessed. That has also been fulfilled as well through the birth of Jesus in Abraham's line, and through Jesus, uh, we are indeed blessed by that. And so, this piece of, you know, God's love here, I feel it's very easy to miss, because it is an act of Love, right? God goes out, acts on His promise, and delivers on His promise. It is not an explicit communication of love, right? But uh, we also know that action speaks louder than words, right? God is not a God that is just giving empty promises. He delivers through a redemptive plan here. And if you were to do sort of a mapping of the way how God shows His love, to our modern day taxonomy, the five love languages, the way how I would see it is, you know, through this redemptive plan, it is an act of service, right? God is, you know, uh, acting out His love for us. And at the same time, because this redemptive act, we don't deserve it, it's a free gift for us, right? And slipping this back to, you know, my earlier anecdote, about my uh, parents. Uh, yes, they're not good at expressing love, but uh, through the first 20 years of my life, um, they have been working very hard to support me so that I can sort of have opportunities in college. And in fact, uh, because of their hard work, I became the first generation college graduate. And as a parent myself, as I look back, I have my own uh, kids. I got to understand this uh, and appreciate this better, right? That uh, acts of service is really, really an important uh, part of love. And I got to see how, you know, uh, and appreciate God's love for us is being acted out as well. Right. So far we have seen three aspects of uh, God's love. You know, there's a very specific reason why God called out to Abraham. Right, through God's redemptive plan, you know, it's very clear that God loves us unconditionally, right? And this part of about unconditional love, also when I was much younger and as a young believer, I didn't quite 
understand that as well. It is only when I became a parent that I started to understand this unconditional part, you know, as a, as a father. Right? Uh, even though, you know, um, I may be impatient, I may be sort of disappointed with my kids' behavior, but at night when I put him to bed, um, the nightlight shines on his face, I look at his face, and deep in my heart, I say to him, Jazzy, that he loves me. And uh, you know, this is just wonderful and amazing, right? Although God is a righteous judge, but at the same time, He is also our Heavenly Father that loves us unconditionally, right? That I only got to understand as I became a father of God's unconditional love. Second point, God loves rightly. His love is not meant for just a group of people, but in fact, anyone that comes to the faith, God accepts willingly, and God wants to love us. And finally, God is the God of His promise. He acts on His promises, and He wants to deliver His promise to anyone that comes to Him. So let's move on. What are the takeaways, right? So individually, now that we've seen and heard that God's Love is unconditional, it's wide, it's acted upon. What is your response to that? Right. For anyone, uh, no matter where, who you are, where you come from, what your history is, know that you are deeply loved by God. And God wants to invite you to be part of His family to receive His blessings. Right. If anyone of you out there things that you're not worthy of God's love. You need to constantly, you know, show your love by doing things to get worldly validation. I tell you, that is actually a lie by the devil, right? God deems you worthy of His love. In fact, your worth does not come from your accomplishments. It does not come from the name or the title of your position. Your job. It doesn't come from how much money you earn. It does not come from acknowledgement or recognition by your peers or your superiors. And most definitely, it does not come from the amount of likes that you get on your social media page, Instagram or TikTok. Right? God has already loved you so dearly that even before you were born, He has set in place a redemptive plan to redeem you. Right, so that you can be with them. For us as a church, right, um, my question to you is, do we truly know God's love for us? And if you don't, I would give two recommendations. The first recommendation is that uh, as you read your Bible, know that the Bible is basically God's love letter to you. And I want to challenge you as you read every chapter of the Bible, read it with the lens that uh, this is God's love letter to me. Read it with the purpose of trying to find where God's love is in a chapter. And I assure you, if you were to read it that way, you will find out things that you have not known about God previously. So that's the first recommendation. The second recommendation I would... Uh, give to you is pray to God, right? Seek and you shall get an answer. Knock and you shall, the door shall be open to you. Pray to God to ask God to help you see His love in your life. But folks out there who are aware of God's love already, right? Simply marvel, right? Marvel, worship Him because His love is unconditional. We don't have to give anything to Him. We are loved the way just as we are. And surrender completely to this great love. Right? Surrender completely to this love. And because of His grace, right, as long as we believe in God, we are accepted as a child of God. And know that our God is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so what that means for you is that if you're a child of God, you're basically a royal bloodline for this majestic King of there. And so my final sort of uh, piece for you is that now that you're a child of God, 
you know, go forth and live your life as proud princes and princesses serving in God's kingdom. So let us close in the word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this message. Thank you for loving us so deeply. May your love compel us to live in a way that you have desired for us. Uh, may your love compel us uh, to show your love to the rest of the world and to love others just like the way you love us. As we go into the next year, 2024, Lord, uh, may we remember this word closely and help it close to our hearts so that we're able to live as solid and light for you in this world. In the name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Sit the benediction of the Lord. Father God, we do thank you for your amazing love, your unconditional love, your wide love, your active love. Thank you that you love us. And Lord, help us to understand a lot more of what your love is all about. And to live like the princes and princesses that you have created us to be. And now I pray that according to Richard Jesus, Lord, we may grant you to be strength. Through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to Him who is able to do far more than what we can think or ask. According to the power of work with us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen and amen. The Lord's blessings on you. Thank you for joining us today. Just ask that before you leave, help us put a chair away. Um,